Good evening, and welcome to the Kennedy Center and the Millennium Stage, our free performance series brought to you by Target. My name is Liz Miller, and I'm manager of artist services in the center's VSA and accessibility department. Millennium Stage is here at 6 o'clock each night of the week, 365 days a year, bringing you the best in theater, music, dance, and more. If you're unable to join us in person, please visit us online at Kennedy hyphen center dot org where we broadcast each night's performance live as well as make past performances available in our broadcast archive tonight's show features five outstanding writers reading their original works each of the writers are participants in the veterans writing workshop an initiative of the new york university creative writing program offering free classes to recent veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Veterans Writing Workshop is supported by Ambassador Jean Kennedy Smith and the Disabled American Veterans Charitable Service Trust. Please note that this show contains adult language and mature themes. This performance is being presented by the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts' Rosemary Kennedy Education Fund, for the Artists on Stage Initiative and the Kennedy Center's Department of VSA and Accessibility. This performance is part of the Kennedy Center and VSA's Arts in the Military Initiatives. Tonight's writers will be reading their works in the same order as their bios appear in your programs, which is alphabetically by last name. Please join me in welcoming the first writer, Mr. Eric Fair. Good evening, and uh, thank you for coming out this evening. Uh, I've written a, sh a, a series of very short stories about a character named Austin. Delete. Austin deletes his friends every year. I know this because I am a transitional friend. I met Austin a week before an annual deletion, so he allowed me to transition over to the next year's list. Austin says this is rare. Austin's funeral is attended by people who believe he died years earlier. Someone finds stickers in the church closet that say, hello, my name is. They do not write their names, they write the year they knew Austin, and then they wander around the room and separate themselves from other years. In high school, Austin travels to Washington, D.C. and fights with his sister in the back seat. They visit monuments and memorials, and a park ranger tells Austin to stop throwing things in the water. In the hotel, there was a gathering of old men in uniform with hats and pins and patches. His father approaches them and says nice things, Austin has never seen his father do this before. In Iraq, Austin boards a plane to come home. At home, Austin boards another plane to go back to Iraq, where he's given an Article 15 for drinking green tinted vodka from a Listerine bottle. Austin attends briefings. He sits in an auditorium and fills out paperwork and answers questions. A lady stands up front and warns them to be careful about their spending habits. She tells them to freeze their credit cards put them in a plastic bag, submerse them in water, and freeze them. It will prevent impulse purchases. The captain talks about drinking. The first sergeant talks about unprotected sex. Corporal Shute inspects their gear. The chaplain talks about suicide. My brother hands Austin a beer and says, the best way to go is with a 30-odd six. He said it's really hard to do. He brings out a rifle and passes it around. We put the barrel into our mouths and try to reach the trigger. It is awkward. Someone says this would cause the weapon to jam. Someone else says it doesn't matter because the round would have already gone off. Someone chips a tooth on the front sight. And we all agree this is a very impressive way to die. Close. Austin lights a bag of dog shit on fire and leaves it on the neighbor's front porch. He runs away and forgets to ring the doorbell. He hides in the bushes and watches it burn. Austin thinks of this as he opens a bag and smells burnt shit. One of the bodies is melted and is bonded with the zipper. Austin yanks and tugs. The body bursts and a sickly fluid saturates his fingers. He holds his hand above the bag and tries to drip the jelly back into the wound. Corporal Shute says the body has been struck by an incendiary round. It sloshes and slurps as the bag is shifted to another row. Corporal Shute lets Austin sit down. Austin wonders what will happen if he's caught opening one of the bags during the rapture. How will all of this get put back together? Austin feels badly about zipping up the bags. The bodies need a way to escape. He takes to tucking the zippers inside the bags. 
Corporal Shute addresses the morning formation and tells the men that someone better stop tucking the fucking zippers inside the bags. More bags arrive. Shute tells the men to keep searching. The platoon keeps a score sheet. Arabic is one point. Handwritten notes are double. Foreign passports score three. Pornography is four. Good pornography is five. Austin finds a foreign passport with a portrait of a body's family. He stops keeping score. Austin decides to stop looking. He turns his head, opens the zipper, and caresses bone and teeth and jelly. He learns to touch lightly so as not to puncture the body cavity again. He continues to find passports and pornography and portraits. Austin spends time at MWR eating Girl Scout cookies and reading Maxim magazine, but tits and thin mints won't keep the bags closed. Corporal Shute posts a reminder to take your body armor with you to the shitter. No one wants to get mortared on the shitter. The explosion would cover you in blue shit fluid. Everyone agrees to clean each other's body if this happens. The bodies in the bags have terrified faces. Apparently, death hurts. Austin doesn't want to die. On Friday, mortars thud, thud, thud into the staging area. The neatly arranged bags of bodies are toppled and torn. Pieces are collected and arranged with some care, but nothing can be done to guarantee a proper match. Time. In high school, Austin has two minutes to give his witness. An old man in a suit tells him that sharing your faith is like surviving in business. If it can't be done in two minutes, it isn't worth doing. He tells them to make the sale. The students use a microphone to give their testimonies. A boy says there's no bridge to cross the Great Divide, but there's a cross to bridge it, and this gets the boy pretty far that night. The students throw frisbees outside while they wait for their parents. Eileen makes an effortless toss across the field to Austin. He tries to send it back, but it flutters and rolls on its side. Eileen takes time to teach Austin. She holds his arm and moves it back and forth. In Iraq, Austin has two minutes to clean the shitter. He scrubs and wipes and adds the blue shit fluid to control the smell. But the squad shakes the box as Austin scrambles to collect his gear. He tries, but he can't get out. Corporal Shute has parked the Humvee up against the door again. Austin struggles to breathe through the heat and the stench as he forces open the top corner of the door and squeezes out under the hood of the truck. Corporal Shute and Austin pull guard together. Shute uses the time to write Austin a counseling statement. Austin signs it and says he will do better. Shute shows Austin a picture of Molly and a young boy. Austin thinks the boy is beautiful. Corporal Shute talks about taking the boy to see the Tennessee Titans when they get home. Austin does not have a picture, but he talks about Eileen. Beyond the truck, there is a disturbance in the line of Iraqi workers waiting to enter the base. Corporal Shute tells Austin to cover him from the vehicle. Austin has trouble swinging the turret into position. Corporal Shute says, relax. Later, Corporal Shute drives the Humvee into a canal, and Austin thinks it looks like the A-team as it rolls over and splashes and hisses, and it takes two minutes for Corporal Shute to drown. Method. The rock in Sedona is red, and it looks like a bell, and many people go there to capture a certain energy. The energy isn't what matters, though. What matters is the process. You take charge of your memories. You order them around, and you release them when they no longer serve a constructive purpose. Dr. Petal tells Austin the Sedona method worked for her. It might work for him, too. Petal hands Austin a golf ball. Roll it around in your hand. Grip it. Tighter. She tells him this is what he's doing with his emotions. Is the golf ball attached to your hand? You can release it at any time, can't you? You control this, Austin. This is not random. She tells Austin to think of something terrible. He tells her. She says, that's not how it works. The memory should remain private in order to avoid the fear of judgment. Austin pretends to think of something else, but Dr. Petal says she can tell he's still focused on the same memory. And to be honest, I'm not so sure the Sedona method is designed for that sort of thing anyways. Dr. Petal gives Austin a golf ball and tells him to work on the process. My brother says the best counselor is a Dr. Johnny Walker. Austin smiles. My brother says all that talking only reminds you of the places you have been. He takes the golf ball from Austin and leads us into the garage. We take positions as my brother tees off. We dodge and cover as the ball ricochets off the concrete walls. We all take turns. We laugh and it hurts. Devil. I see Austin for the last time at the Church of Christ. He and the pastor stand in the dunk tank behind the choir. It looks like an aquarium, the kind that hold the dying lobsters at the grocery store. During the children's chat, the pastor hands out swim goggles to illustrate a point. 
Austin and the pastor stand on stage together. The pastor calls Austin a new creation and says baptism is like deleting the devil from your contact list. I speak to Austin in Fellowship Hall. He's holding a pair of plastic swim goggles and drying his hair. He tells me it is time for another deletion. He offers me another year on the list. He says this makes me lucky. Thank you. Next reader this evening will be Matt Gallagher. Hello. This is a uh, short story entitled Section 60. The call came during breakfast. It's happening again. Okay, I said. This is the third time this month. Talk to her. She listens to you. No, she doesn't. Make her go away. It's part of your job. I wouldn't say that. I would. Get rid of her. This isn't a goddamn therapy center. Okay. I sighed and picked up my granola. I'll take care of it. Hurry. The walk from the lodge was bright and quiet. The air clung to my skin like honey. Most visitors wouldn't arrive for many hours. People tended to visit the dead at midday, even in summer. The path rose and fell softly through green hills, and everywhere I looked, marble, head, marble heads glinted underneath a fat sun. By the time I got on sight, She'd already dug a hole. It was small and shallow, though, not big enough for William yet. She wore a pair of violet gardening gloves and held a shovel that was much too tall for her. Morning, I said. Thought you might want an iced coffee. No, thank you, she said, taking off her straw hat to wipe sweat from her brow. But I sure could use some help with this. You know I can't do that, I said. You know that. Her eyes narrowed and turned to steel. Just as hard, just as gray. Well then, could the big macho man get an old woman her sunscreen? It's in the front seat. I put the coffees on the hood and grabbed the sunscreen. The inside of the car smelled like hot ashtray. I walked over to the hole and handed her the tube. She set down the shovel. Thank you, she said. I apologize for snapping like that. I'm just so sick of the mugginess here. We Asheville girls need a mountain breeze to stay sane. Not a problem, ma'am. I paused. You should have waited for a better day, one with an overcast. Perhaps. Ma'am, I, do you know why they chose this plot of land, Mr. Mitchell? I don't, before my time. Because there's plenty of room, that's why. It says exactly that on the website. It says that they didn't know how much they were going to need when it all started, so they chose here. Her skin was as pale as smoke. She rubbed the sunscreen in as the sounds of the city roared from the highway, and I stood there, unsure of what to say next. So, are you going to call the old guard soldiers on me again, she said. We laughed. She'd confuse the hell out of those boys, telling them they looked too skinny and offering to, br offering to bring them sandwiches the next time. They'd shown up expecting a rioter foaming at the mouth with rage. Instead, they'd found a Presbyterian who asked about their families, wearing the saddest of smiles. I think I will take that coffee, she said. I nodded, and we walked over to the car, leaning against it. Twice in one month, you're getting bold. I'm getting desperate. William belongs here. You know that. But no one will help. No one will help us at all. I'm just a groundskeeper, and I'm just a mother. I sipped my coffee and watched a pair of songbirds fly from oak to oak. Except for her hole, the grass was full and green. The hedgerows were freshly clipped and uniform. I was proud of our work here. I bumped into the deputy super. He said it may take time, but that maybe, someday, don't talk to me about that man. Her eyes flashed steel. I know what he is. I'd heard about her running with him. The Arlington rumor mill was still spinning from it. Some people said it happened at the grocery store. Others said the post office. Still others claimed that she followed him home one day and cornered him in his own driveway. There was no debate about what the incident entailed, however. 
After a heated argument, she'd slapped him hard, hard enough across the face to dislodge a loose tooth. He called the cops in response, though his wife wouldn't let him press charges. It's absurd, she continued. Do you know what a woman from the VA told me? That I need to stop grieving and to start healing. The gall of that woman, the absolute gall. That's pretty bad, I said. But, I mean, maybe, you know. These people, they usually know what they're talking about. They're professionals. I'll never stop grieving, but it might help if you all let me bury my son. I wanted to hug her, but remembered that it, that it would only make things worse. I walked over to the hole and picked up the shovel. A worm poked out of the soft earth. It didn't move. I squatted down and saw that it had been cleanly sliced into three fatty pieces, all exactly the same size. I returned to the car, handing over the tool. Sneaking a glance through a back window this time, I spotted a miniature flag. Next to it was the urn, small and spare and made of red clay. You served, didn't you, Mr. Mitchell? She asked. I did. My back straightened a bit. Twelve years. Did you see combat? I thought about the mud, the forests, the ten-day tank battles. It all felt real. But the old guard called us cold warriors behind our backs. This bothered me, though I pretended like it didn't. No, ma'am. Different time. Different army. Then you wouldn't understand. She shook her head. Will wasn't the same when he came back. He didn't laugh. He didn't get angry. He just didn't care. He was gone. Still over there. I prayed every night when he was away, and when he came back, I praised God because it was over. But it wasn't. Not at all. He died in the desert, just like the rest. I know. I chewed on my bottom lip and thought about how I didn't understand, how I'd never understand, and how more than anything else, I wanted to understand. I know. I think too much change did it. Will always needed a group. I always took so much pride in being a part of one. The Army had that, and then it took it away. When he got out, he was all by himself, with no one to talk to. What could I do? It had always just been the two of us, and then it wasn't anymore. He, he hated change more than anything. He cried as a boy when the scientists changed the name of the Brontosaurus to Apatosaurus. And you know what else? You know what my William said on his 10th birthday? He said, Mom, I don't want to be 10. I liked being 9. I didn't respond. More of these boys have come back and done it themselves than have actually been killed over there. Her body shook in the heat, but her voice remained clear and strong. What is going on? Why is no one helping them? And girls too, I said. Them too. Lots of girls in these wars. What? am I supposed to do, she said slowly. He died of a wound. He died from battle. He belongs here with his brothers. You recognize that. Why can't boys like him come here? I don't know, I said. I wish I did. Have you, have you tried other military cemeteries? This is Arlington. Williams or Russell, and it fits you on my side. Both of his grandfathers lie here. His great-great-grandfather fought at Chancellorsville and is just down the road. Another cemetery? No, I haven't tried another cemetery. She took off her violet gardening gloves and put the shovel in the trunk. Then she got behind the wheel of her car. I'll be back, she said, and one of these days I'll finish before you can stop me. I hope you do. Thank you for the coffee. Enjoy the day, Mr. Mitchell. Same to you, ma'am. I stood in the road as she drove toward the far gate. After moving some of the shovel dirt and grass back into place, I walked back to the lodge, taking the long way there. I stopped at the Tomb of the Unknowns and watched the changing of the old guard. They were as sharp as ever. A young boy sniffled, and his father put his hand on his shoulder. The boy didn't want to watch anymore but his father made him. Afterward, I went back to work. We had a busy day ahead. Four new headstones to ready in place.
Thank you. Our next reader is Matthew Molina. Thank you all for coming. Um, reading an excerpt from my in-progress novel entitled The Anatomy of an Explosion. The sun will keep him warm, and I suppose this resembles sympathy, that his body will never miss a beat or degree. And though the sand is stained like a pollock canvas, he looks no different slumped against that hesco. The failing sun glinting over the tops of Contratrina and matte black of the Beretta loosen his grip. I cleaned it for him yesterday. We can call him green, though I call him Collins. A lanky so cowboy with some past he never talked of. I'm not sure what is keeping me here as I lean against the exposed brick of a hastily stuccoed wall. I cannot blame them for wanting him to hurry, to stop wasting our time. The desperation found within self-inflicted bullet wounds, and he seemed to be lacking gumption or balls, whatever we are supposed to have in the end, while others take momentary relief to hole up inside on battered cots for a minute of rest. None of them complaining about the absence of Freon, only calling up command to give a shaky report of a KIA before closing their eyes. That's my excuse. I'm waiting. Amongst the tea barriers and half-eaten MRE packets, computer speakers beating along to George on repeat, raised voice seemingly lacking soul. For the higher-ups to make it out here just to tell us he will rot, and I'll laugh if they hit some EFP, never understanding why we set our fob off out Irish. In the earshot of Baghdad and the pleas of morning prayer. I'll never take the time to learn the language, and he was known to skim the book of Job, but he decided on that Hesco, the one we always pissed against, never wanting to use a makeshift portage on for anything other than masturbating to Ink Magazine. Because I'll wait until I'm done with the cigarette, some British brand found in local markets, so I can see the curl of smoke against this backdrop. Why we just stood around to watch him eat his gun. Why I swore there was laughter or a sigh when he pulled the trigger. And I miss home and the scratches that come from exploring the woods, loving the girl next door. And I tossed small flat stones underhand into his lap for something of a burial, wanting to grab him up to plead that I have only one regret, but no, I will never repeat this story never to explain how we watch one of us blow his brains out to gain back sleep, and we'll clean up the mess later. And I miss the desert, the feeling of my own movement, a view of the world passing underfoot. But Texas is a long way from New York, and I wake in Little Rock to an elderly man settling next to me, an issue with the rail as he keeps bending over to see the world gone by. And I smile, and he gladly accepts it along with the theory that I'm a friend to talk to. Where are you heading, son? Before I can respond, I am left breathless, knowing his eyes catch the color of my bag and the unit patch and the combat infantry badge, missing the touch of Sharpie, gleaming. Are you coming home from holiday, sir? No, 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 son. I can see it in your eyes, the same look the boys had when they came back from Korea. He's giddy. Sorry to disappoint, sir. I haven't been over just yet. Soon, I hope. It's OK, really. Never got to war myself. Always one for the stories, though. You think it's anything like the movies? I wish it were that heroic. And from what I've heard, it is, sir. Have your friends gone over? Yes, sir. He grinned something sly, and I want to slit his throat. Good stories? Yes, sir. Care to give me a taste of the action, son? I wish I could, sir. But to be honest, I don't remember any of them. The disappointment is obvious, the kick in his voice a bit lighter, but why give him more? To let him think he met something of a war hero. There are too many memories, and I refuse to play the lead role, not wanting his wife fucking him over what I did once. He goes on to show families of pictures of a family in decline, of his two sons, one of them a bastard at 40 who lives at home after losing his money in the failing housing market, and a daughter, their children, 
how he once worked in Schenectady in the GE plant that is now closed. But eventually I drift as he reads some kitsch Clancy novel, resting my head against a decades old vinyl, which is warm to the touch, following the snow covered countryside through a half inch sheet of smudge glass. I'm comfortable and I can't shake the feeling that this may be a mistake, though I am 7,408 miles away. There are habits formed, blaming on the long hours spent, or subsequent rush found within momentum, when I can sh shut it all out. And through the Lakeshore Limited and Penn and Track 19 towards Ronkonkoma, I could have called, could have given them something of a homecoming, but has learned to lean to pay the cab, I smell the cheap whiskey on his breath, used to get him through the cold nights. Pardon me hopes we never made it this far, to feel the compacted snow and salt, where the cold cuts through the ever-present heat still felt, something reminiscent, not this light devoid home with its harsh lines and stark white siding. The driveway is empty with only the frozen imprints of tire treads. I walk up, cobbled steps to the front door. As shadows dance through the leaded window, this is home, and I feel nothing of the natural without the sand that I'm used to. To move on is what I wanted, perhaps needed, after all this time away. But a part of me seems to be dying, and I suppose that is where I've gone wrong. The loss of fear, something of the end in life seems muted. With the pressure of a heavy hand, I depress the door handle and push, but to a certain relief, it does not budge. Locked, I grab up my bags. I just want to sleep. The steps to the back gate are covered with snow, but I can see the footprints of my father from searching for a shovel. I trace his steps with my own boots in order to leave no imprint of myself on the pristine white that covers the way into the backyard, to leave no remnant. And I have taken this path many times in my younger years in order to escape from a house I thought was overwhelming and unbearable, to drink and smoke and fuck in my teenage years while my parents slept, before I left this island behind for dreams of heroism and blown away. Taking for granted has been a habit of mine as I reach the window to my room. Shut tight to the world, I pop off the screen and slowly lift the window knowing it was unlocked, but afraid they will know I am breaking the seal of a room long uninhibited. My bags suddenly let their real weight be known, and the body that holds them feels as windswept and ravaged as the planes the train passed through a day earlier. I slip through the window, to slowly, slowly to hear them land on my bed and roll violently on the floor. My arms are tired, but they have enough strength to bring me through the window. And I stand to survey the room. My eyes adjust, but I'm afraid to bring any more light in. This room has become a shrine and my heart breaks because I could care less to quickly undress and find a pair of shorts in the exact location I left them over a year ago. I lock the door and slip beneath the cold sheets and wait to handle everything when I wake. Thank you very much. <laughs> next, uh, the next reader is uh, Perry O'Brien. Uh, this story is called Poughkeepsie. It's 0300 and I'm sitting on the sidewalk in front of Port Authority trying to make a plan. I can't keep purchase on my thoughts with all this night traffic. Taxis and limousines, garbage trucks, buses filled with vacant seats and harsh fluorescent light. This restless march of cars, all of them awake at crow piss and going somewhere. I was going somewhere too. It's raining a little and the light from the television screens gets distorted in the wet air. Everything is sponged in a mist of color, even the smog from down below where passing trains rattle along the unchristly nethers of the bus station. Through it all, I keep hearing Charlotte, her voice shingled by payphone static. Medrick, she says, what would you even do here? She thought that was an explanation. A female reservist is guarding the entrance to the bus station. She's looking rugged in her plus-size digital camis and her pistol belt is decorated with big loops of plastic flex cuffs. When the wind comes up, the plastic loops do a little dance on her hips. I caught her eye on me one time. What if she asked for my leave papers? With all the puddles and boogie darkness between every building, you'd think New York would be a good place for a man to hide. But the army is everywhere. 
Look around, all you can see are porn shops, drug stores, and chain restaurants. Kill the illumination and it wouldn't look much different from Fort Hood. This morning I met a coke dealer on the 1045 from Columbus. His name was Ron, but he preferred I call him Birdman. Ron liked my tattoos. He showed me the pieces he picked up inside, three black stars, scribbled together in a shock group on his neck. In prison, you had to make your own ink by melting down styrofoam cups, mixing the burnt slag with water. For a needle, they sharpen a paperclip. Ron hadn't gone in for drugs. He did seven years for assaulting his wife with a soup can. Ron was surprised to hear the war was still going on. He showed me a picture of his wife. She was up in Saginaw and couldn't wait to start over. I showed him the photo of Charlotte. The picture was from her freshman year, five young ladies crowded together on a blanket, all wearing volunteers for the Catskill Folk Fest. On the back she wrote, I'm one of these, as if I wouldn't be able to tell. Calling first, that must have been my mistake. I was just too excited. All the way from Texas, I kept the surprise inside me, sleeping on buses and benches, talking with flatlanders and seed folk, worrying, eating out of vending machines, imagining the look on her face. Charlotte always said she liked surprises but she got real quiet when I told her I was coming to Poughkeepsie. I asked what was wrong, if maybe she was spooked by the idea of finally seeing each other. Then she got ugly with me. And now I'm sitting on my rucksack, stranded in this god-awful city. I picture Poughkeepsie like a village from the Middle Ages. In her letters, Charlotte described the big castles covered in vine, forests of respectable trees, stone bridges crossing over rivers filled with swans and lake fish. Charlotte said the gardens were the best part. She wrote about daffodils, pansies, foxglove, and some names for flowers I'd never heard before. My favorite of those is clouded geranium. You can't say the name of the flower fast. You have to slow down. It helped over there sometimes. Go ahead and try. Clouded geranium. In the spring, Charlotte started doing work study with the grounds team. Their job was to lay down seeds and mulch, trim the grass, and pick up fallen tree branches after a big storm. She said she liked the work, except for the rabbits. Someone's pet bunny had escaped back in the day, and I guess this bunny nosed out some kind of rangy, hard scruff, wild hair, and those two must have procreated fiercely because now the whole campus was overrun. Other students thought they were cute, but for the grounds team, these rabbits were like a plague from the Bible. They excavated fresh seed from the earth, left gnaw marks on bare roots, even scoured long strips of bark from the younger trees. Charlotte's team tried everything to get rid of the rabbits. Cayenne pepper, clippings of human hair, even dried wolf piss. They wanted to use poison, but the environmental club said, hell no. What would I do in Poughkeepsie? I'd show the kids how to deal with rabbits. I've got a good knife and a poncho liner, everything you need to live in the woods. When I get to Poughkeepsie, I'll climb into the trees and make a bivouac. From there, I'll study the rabbits' movements. I'll watch where they eat, where they screw, and I'll chart out every tunnel on a laminated map. My campaign will begin with overwhelming force. I'll plant snares in the rose bushes. I'll drop down on the rabbits from tree perches and break their little buck teeth. I'll chase snakes and weasels into their burrows, climb down there myself, yowling like a starved dog. The rabbits will be forced to dig deeper. They'll huddle in dark pockets of the earth and live off dead onions. Charlotte will discover the little mounds of charred rabbit flesh I'll scatter around the garden to make an example of anyone who pokes their head above ground. Just a few nubbles of blackened fur, other than that, the gardens will be perfect. Of course, I won't be able to stay hidden forever. Someone will see me, maybe a couple of kids out for a romantic walk. They'll pause on the bridge to look up at the fresh glint of stars, and they'll squeeze hands and whisper forever into each other's mouths. That's when they'll catch sight of me, wild and bent down among the cattails, splashing blood from my hands and face. Questions will be asked. Search parties will be deployed into the woods. Eventually, someone from the school newspaper will get a blurry photo. A pale body loping through the forest, wearing a hat made from lopped off rabbit ears. <laughs> that female MP has been talking into her radio, like maybe there's a chance she's checking my description. I left everything at Fort Hood very carefully, all my gear stacked and folded in my barracks room, the full battle rattle except, of course, the boots I'm wearing. Supply Daddy told me they don't come after you if you leave all your stuff behind. Still, if someone runs my driver's license, it'll come up absent without leave. Or maybe even diver desertion, since there's a war. They used to hang people for that. It was the deaf box that made me realize I was leaving. When we got back to Hood, they ran us through a battery of tests. Check boxes about our psychological health, blood draws and knocking on our joints, x-rays to make sure we hadn't picked up any shrapnel. 
Finally, you take a turn in the death box. It's a big glass chamber, and once the door shuts, the silence is so heavy you worry about suffocating. You wear headphones, and they tell you to listen for the beep. I didn't realize before then how long it had been since things were quiet. The silence was pressing on my ears, and all I was thinking about was Charlotte and her gardens because other things were coming up fast and it was better to think about the gardens. When I came out, my hearing was fine, but I was blinking and snotty and there were wet trails on my cheek, and the tech guy looked away and said, don't worry about it, it happens to a lot of folks coming back. Probably something about the different pressure in that room. But I wasn't thinking about that, I was thinking about Charlotte. Her first letter was addressed to any soldier, any soldier, imagine that. A million guys over there, and her letter happens to end up in the post connex nearest my unit. Scrambled in with notes from church light ladies and little kids' drawings of a dead Osama, here was Charlotte, nervous about her junior year, writing about flowers. I'm not sentimental. I don't know about destiny or whatever, but you'd be dumb to give up on chances like that. I grab my rucksack, pull my hood down, and go back around the corner. The payphone is decorated in curly cues of dripping black graffiti and half-peeled stickers. I punch in Charlotte's number and let it ring and ring. Across the street, they're advertising a new war game. Pictures flash across a display of television screens. Soldiers crashing out of the waves at Normandy. Soldiers wriggling under canopies of barbed wire. Soldiers hunkered down in muddy foxholes, waiting, chewing on all those broken promises. The phone keeps ringing. This time in the morning, she's not in her dorm. I want to yank the receiver out of its receptacle, swing it by the cord, and whip that phone up into the sky. I sit down on my ruck and feel like crying. You're on my time, First Sergeant used to say. Now that I'm on my own time, I don't know what to do with it. So back to the rabbits. Once I've got them cowering in their burrows, I will return with an offer of peace. I'll explain that nibbling on flowers is beneath them. They could accomplish more with their lives. I'll spend a year training the rabbits. They'll learn small team tactics, how to react to an ambush. We'll dig new tunnels together, deep down until we hit the foundations of those old castles. I'll show them how to make bombs out of garden fertilizer. On graduation day, we'll take to school. Charlotte will be a senior, posing for photos with her family. It'll be a warm, special kind of day. We'll wait until the perfect moment, when the celebrity is done with the speech about believing in yourself. Diplomas will be passed out, and everyone will throw their caps up in the air. That's when the castles will start exploding. Big, billowy blasts from underground, the kind that rip up dirt and throw it for miles in the air. Those old castles will fall right down. That's when my combat teams of rabbits will pop out of their holes, squealing and biting at ankles. All the students and families and professors will be running away, hundreds of black robes billowing in the wind, leaving the gardens undefended. The rabbits will eat everything. They'll gorge themselves on whole root systems, mangling the tender vines and leaves and flowers, mashing delicate blossoms between their little teeth. Their black eyes will smoke with victory. Then they'll go for the grass, eating every green and living thing until Poughkeepsie is a desert of black graduation caps, ruined towers, and endless, endless dunes of dried rabbit dung. I'll find Charlotte. She'll be stumbling away from the fires, her robes all in tatters, makeup running with tears down her face. She'll demand to know why, why, and I'll say, I needed something to do. For a while, I'll be named King of the Rabbits. Of course, my victory will be short-lived. With no food left, the rabbits will turn on me, unable to forgive my past abuses. I'll be chased from my own kingdom, set loose back into the world, on the run again. Two taxis collide at the intersection up the street, the sound of tires screeching and smashing metal echoing off the block. The female reservist hustles over to the scene where the drivers are already screaming at each other in two different languages. By and by, the day comes up. The mirrored buildings are casting sun down into the street, and for a second, the millions of little glass pieces shine like gold around the wrecked taxis, but then the sun changes, and the buildings return to the perfect indifference of an ocean, cold and black and flat-ass calm, bored by the day's violence. Seems like it's going to be a warm morning. The station will open soon, and a thousand buses will be gone before lunchtime, rumbling down co concrete ramps, through traffic, and out into the country. The buses will go to Poughkeepsie and every other town, to airports where people are flying out to China or Africa or back to Iraq. I could be on any of them, or I could just sit here on my rucksack watching the city fill up with sunlight. Thank you. The next reader is Roy Scranton.
This is an excerpt from my novel, Strange House. Day and night, bombs, rockets, and missiles crashed into Baghdad, erupting in bursts of flame, obliterating buildings and bodies. They watched it on TV, they heard it on the radio, and they saw it from their roof, and when they ventured into the street, soldiers and civilians, arms and legs blackened and pulverized, intestines spilling onto concrete, homes and barracks, walls ripped open, Ba'athists and Islamists, communists and social democrats, grocers, tailors, construction workers, nurses and teachers, all hiding in dim burrows built out of fear and desperation, waiting to die. And many did. Men and women, boys and girls, infants and elders, some slowly from disease and infection, others quick in bursts of light, tumbling stones and halos of dust, crushed by the weight of the world's greatest army. Maha sat in her room listening to Britney Spears, wishing she was anywhere else. This war was going to ruin her life. She knew it. It was going to ruin her chances for marriage. It was going to ruin everything. Her skin was breaking out, her hair frizzing and splitting. She couldn't believe it. She stood at her window and looked through the slit between two pieces of plywood nailed over the glass and watched smoke drift over her city and the smoke was her future fading into haze. She started hitting her sister Nazaha hard. She hated how Nazaha kept praying, stupid praying to stupid God like it would do anything. She hated her mother Thariah her father, her sick cousin Qasim, who she had to keep nursing. She hated her mother's patience and stillness. She hated her other sister Warda's incessant singing. They were all conspiring against her. None of them appreciated how terrible it was for beautiful 17-year-old Maha to have her fabulous life ruined. She stood at her window and looked between the two pieces of plywood and watched flames burn along the edge of the city and wanted to see it devoured. And more bombs fell. Day and night, smoke clouded the city and the sky, uh, sky and the sun blazed like blood. Air raid sirens would wail and all across the city people would look up, drop what they were doing and hide. Then the sirens would subside and no bombs would fall. Then the all clear would sound, or not, or suddenly the street would explode. The anti-aircraft guns hacking away were equally random. Were they shooting at anything, or just to make themselves feel better? Who knew? What people grew to depend on was the mosque. After every bombing, out from the many minarets across the city, the muezzin would sound, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illa Allah, and more bombs fell on the city. Warda kept herself busy. She could not bear to be still. As soon as she stopped moving, her mind bloomed with thoughts of her husband and boys, of the horror their deaths held. She couldn't think of her little Siraj's young body, lifeless and torn, or Abdul Majid, who cried and fussed so much, falling quiet forever. It was an emptiness, the depths of which Warda refused to look into. To lose her beloved husband Ratib, whose skin she adored, whose shoulders she clung to, whose lips and cheeks she loved so dearly she ached when she looked at him, after all their struggles would be losing the world. She couldn't bear the thought of it. So she mended. She cleaned. She baked. She'd watch movies sometimes with the family, a little, but her mind wandered and after a few minutes she'd get back up and find something to do. She reorganized the kitchen and the closets. She dusted behind the TV. She sewed, swept, wiped, scrubbed. The hours of her days, a hole that would not be filled, a thirst that could not be quenched. And while she struggled to fill the emptiness opening up beneath her, Warda sang, quietly, songs from her childhood, her soft and lilting voice sounding through the house and soothing the family. Her manner was so patient, her songs so serene, they all grew calmer because of her. They could not see through her mask and had no idea her songs were only noise to hush an endless silence. And more bombs fell on the city. Bread prices doubled, tripled, quadrupled. There was no propane. 
There was no benzene. The satellite went in and out, an Iraqi state TV shut down, but the radio played patriotic songs and reports of the Americans' defeat. When they could, they watched CNN, Al Jazeera, Fox News, or the BBC. They watched oil pits burn. They saw balls of fire rise up in the night across the Dijla, red and gold flowers gleaming back in black water. They saw their city in green from above, in videos made by the men who were killing them, bright neon stripes cutting the screen, pale green explosions below. They watched reporters in Kuwait, Qatar, and Israel put on gas masks. They watched American machines push across the desert. They watched Iraqi soldiers surrender. They watched Iraqi soldiers die. They watched their husbands, sons, and brothers forced to their knees and thrown like trash into the backs of trucks. On Al Jazeera, they saw children killed by soldiers, broken bodies leaking like crushed melons, the bitter fruit of war's harvest. On CNN, they saw generals stand in front of big maps full of arrows. Allahu Akbar, cried the Muezzin, la ilaha illa Allah, and more bombs fell on the city. The lights went out, the electricity went out, the water stopped running, the gas shut off, it came back on, it shut off again. Allahu Akbar, cried the Muezzin, la ilaha illa Allah. Day and night, bombs, rockets, and missiles crashed down into Baghdad, erupting in plumes of smoke, strewing wreckage in the moaning wounded. They watched Umm Qasr fall. They watched Basra fall. They watched An Nazaria fall. They watched Karbala fall. Nazaha prayed. She bore the abuse of her sister Maha, the discomforts when there was no light, no electricity, no water, the terror that smothered her nights. She bore it all, praying constantly to God and Muhammad, to Khadija, the Prophet's wife, Fatima, the Prophet's daughter, and Michael Jackson. God was testing them, just like he tested Muhammad, and she would show her heart's truth. So devout in her prayer was she that her absent-mindedness grew worse than ever. She let the tea kettle boil over. She burned bread. She forgot to give Qasim his antibiotic. She swept up the kitchen and left a small, tidy pile of dirt in the middle of the floor. Warda chided her. Maha hit her. And Nazaha prayed for forgiveness and mercy. She prayed to be less absent-minded. She prayed to God to keep them all safe. It was hard to feel the nearness of God. More and more she spent her hours alone, writing out prayers on slips of paper, reading the Quran and books on the Sarah and the Hadith. She drew secret pictures of Muhammad and Michael Jackson writing the Barak together, the white-winged, woman-faced horse that carried Muhammad on the Isra and the Mirage. She pictured Muhammad and Michael Jackson walking together in the desert, holding hands, Fatima walking behind them. She imagined they spoke of the jagged beauty of palm trees and the buzz of bees, the way honey dripped clear and golden on flatbread, her father's smell when he'd been smoking, and of how the purity of love, compassion, and mercy would conquer all. How great God is to have given us such a world with red tomatoes and green reeds and the great brown dijla, the wonder of the Muezzin's call and the glory of thriller, the perfection of tea at tea time, bed at bedtime, and breakfast at breakfast time. Nazaha prayed in ecstasies of gratitude that she was alive and that God had made the world and that the world was so perfect and full. And more bombs fell on the city. The power went out for good, the phones and water too. They passed rumors from their neighbors at breakfast and rumors from the baker at lunch. They passed rumors from the radio at nighttime and rumors from their dreams at dawn. They began to hear artillery fire, mortars, distant thumps, and closer crashes. Suddenly, Americans, tanks in the streets, Humvees ran down the avenues, heavy guns lobbing explosive rounds at shadows, rifles, machine guns. Now the chatter of small arms fire peppered their days and nights. Americans everywhere, shooting at everything. They quit going out. They locked the gate. They spoke to their neighbors through a crack in the second story window. One night they listened to a tank roll down their street. They heard it stop, 
They heard the whine of its turret. They heard its gunfire, hell cracking open. Then again, feeling it in their bellies, thumbs and knees. They looked at each other and prayed. Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illa Allah. They heard a machine gun go tuck, tuck, tuck. Then the tank roll away. A house down the street, empty because its owners had fled to the countryside before the war, had been the target. Two gaping holes like blank eye sockets watched the street. And more bombs fell on the city. And more bombs fell on the city. Allahu Akbar, cried the muezzin. La ilaha illa Allah. Baghdad had fallen. Thank you. We'd also like to thank uh, the Kennedy Center for having us, uh, the NYU Writers Program, Ambassador Jean Kennedy Smith, the Disabled American Veterans Charitable Service Trust, and especially thank you all for coming out. It would have been lonely if nobody showed up. <laughs>